Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Galetz, and I'm a program facilitator with the Regina District Industry Education Council in the SunWest School Division. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Chantelle Peterson, who is a dental hygienist. Chantelle graduated from Rosetown Central High School and then began her training towards her uh, dental hygienist certification. During her presentation, we'll learn about what the occupation entails and the interesting training path Chantelle took to get to where she is today. Just a reminder before we begin, this session is being recorded and will appear on the RDIEC YouTube channel for you or others to view in the future. Just go to the RDIEC website at www.rdiec.ca to find the YouTube channel. Chantelle, thanks for taking time to do the session today, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Chantelle. I am a registered dental hygienist, and I am going to be talking to you today about what it is like to do that. So I've actually been a registered dental hygienist for 13 years. And before that, I was a dental assistant. So I have about 17 years altogether in the dental field. And I currently work full time at a general practice office in the city. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say that dental hygiene, it differs between province to province and country to country. And because I work in Saskatchewan, that is what I'm going to be talking about based on that. So. What is a dental hygienist? A dental hygienist is an oral health professional whose area of expertise focuses on preventative oral health care on a wide range of patients. We work collaboratively with dentists and other oral health professionals to provide optimal oral health care to our patients. So dental hygiene is actually more than just scaling. We need to talk to them about brushing technique, flossing technique. We need to inform them on the disease process. So it's healthy tissues to gingivitis, to periodontitis, to bone loss, and they need to know where they fall on that scale. And it's really important to be um, their patient's educator is basically what we are. So on this slide here, what are the responsibilities of a dental hygienist? I'm going to talk about your typical appointment. And then after the next slide, I'll go over some other things that people maybe don't see. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to come in, you're going to disinfect your operatory, you're going to set up, you're going to put all your instruments out, get the suction, the air water, the polishing paste, everything set out, get ready for the patient. Once the patient's here, you're going to go and you're going to grab the patient. And this is actually where I do my initial assessment just to take a look at the patient. Are they happy? Are they smiling? How are they walking? Do they want to be here? I can kind of tell how the appointment is going to go just by walking in with them for the five seconds that it takes. The next thing you're going to do after you set them down, um, you're going to do a medical history. So you're going to go over any medications that a patient is taking, any allergies, medical conditions any recent hospitalizations or surgeries. This is actually a really important part of the appointment because you need to see if the patient can actually undergo treatment today. Um, some patients are resistant to, to tell you what medications they are taking. They don't understand why. And once you tell them that if you have a medical emergency in your chair and you have to phone EMS and we can't tell them what medications that patient is taking and they don't get the urgent care that they need. So once you tell them that, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'll tell you my, my medications. And sometimes they also, they don't want to tell you what they're for, but I usually just bring up Google, I type in the medication and then it tells me anyways. Um, so after you've done the medical history, if you are taking, if you're going to be doing an exam, you have to start with taking x-rays and hygienists take three different types, bite wings, uh, periapicals, we call them PAs, and a panorex. So the bite wings, you'll take them every year. The, they're the pictures that you bite down onto. Those are the, the radiographs that we use to detect any tartar, any cavities, and we also check the bone levels as a dental hygienist. If we see cavities on the x-ray, we're actually not allowed to diagnose, so we just kind of got to keep it to ourselves until the dentist comes in. The periapicals, if a patient is having pain, um, something's been bothering them for a while, the dentist is going to want a PA, as we call them, and you're going to take a picture of the root of that tooth to see if there's any infection or anything going on. The Panorex, that's not taken very often. It's once every five years for patients, but a patient stands there and it does a full 360 around their head to get that big, um, that view. Usually um, that picture is taken for wisdom teeth. 
Okay, so you've taken the x-rays. Now you're gonna tip them back and you're actually gonna do what's called scaling. And this is actually what is gonna be done for most of your appointment. You're gonna remove the tartar and the plaque buildup and you're gonna use your hand instruments or you're gonna use a cavitron. And that's an instrument that's, it vibrates back and forth and it sprays water so that the instrument doesn't get too hot. Usually use the cavitron on patients that have really heavy tartar buildup and it just goes a lot faster and it's easier on your hands. With the scaling, it's all tactile sensitivity. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your Explorer and you're just gonna feel under the gums and it's gonna, you might catch on some things and then that's when you go and you switch to your hand instruments and you scale it off or you can use the Cavitron. After I clean the, the mouth, uh, remove the tartar, I'll do a gum assessment, okay? So I like to check recession. That's where the gum goes down and the root surface starts to show. We wanna check pockets. This is really important as well. We do that at least once a year. Um, that's the space between your tooth and the gum. You're measuring where the gum, where you can see the top of the gum to where the gum connects back to the tooth. And the deeper the pockets, the harder it is to clean and you need to know how deep the pockets are or how healthy are, they are because that will help you decide how often to bring the patients back. And then also sometimes, um, well, patients probably don't know this, but we do a cancer screening. So we're going to check the tissues on the cheeks, under the tongue, on top of the tongue, around the lips. And if we find anything that kind of looks out of the ordinary, we'll ask the patient to either watch it. And if it doesn't go away, have them come back in two weeks. Or if we see something that is pretty serious that we know is serious. We'll go grab the dentist, have them come take a look, and then they'll probably refer um, them to a specialist. So now that that's all done, we're gonna do a polish and that's just removing the external stains. It's not gonna make your teeth uh, whiter um, by whitening products, but just to remove like coffee, tea, um, wine stains and things like that. And if you're doing a checkup, if your dentist hasn't come by now to do the checkup, you've got to go run around the office and try and find him or her to do that. And then at the very end, you're going to do a fluoride application. It takes 10 seconds. All we do is a little paint on. And then they are, you can set them up. And this is where I actually like to go over oral hygiene instructions. So are there areas that they can brush better? Um, if they need to start flossing, maybe we can teach them an easier way to floss or, um, tweak their technique a bit if they are a flosser. And then we also, I also mentioned the disease process because they need to know where they stand. Some patients, they have those deep pockets and they don't understand why they have to keep coming back. But once you, uh, once they, they don't understand why they have to keep coming back every three or four months, once you explain to them that if the tartar stays in there and it's gonna lead to tooth loss and they're like, okay, maybe I will come back every three months. So then at my office, we actually can book the patient's next appointment in the in the room. And then I walk the patient out. When I come back, I document all my findings in the computer. This is a legal document. So if you ever have to go to court or anything like that, it's right there. So make sure you document everything that happened in the appointment. It's also a really good idea to document things. If the patient doesn't come back and see you, um, for the next person that sees the patient, they're gonna know uh, what to do or um, how things looked and so on. Then you're gonna clean up your operatory. You're gonna disinfect it. You're gonna wipe it down. You're gonna take your instruments to the sterilization area. You're gonna scrub them and clean those up. And then you're gonna get ready for the next patient. So some of the responsibilities of a dental hygienist that patients don't really see and it's behind the scenes, charting. That is when the dentist comes in and say a person, a patient needs uh, filling on a back tooth, you have to put it into the computer. And I think it's the Dentrix um, uh, system that they use to um, chart fillings. You need to be able to determine appropriate hygiene schedule. So that's what I was telling, talking about before. Do they need to come every three or four months, six months, nine months, 12 months? Every person is different. So don't um, paint them all with the same paintbrush. Um, this kind of goes with insurance. When I see a patient, I let them know what they need that is best for their oral health and overall health. If it doesn't, if it's not covered by insurance, that doesn't matter to me because I want them to be healthy. Um, so for the insurance, I do, you don't have to know as a dental hygienist what insurance covers, but I do like to know when it comes to the hygiene side of things. So usually, um, a polish is covered twice a year, fluoride once a year, and then um, 
sometimes insurance companies give patients a certain set of money to use throughout the year. And sometimes it only covers a certain amount of units of scale. Uh, hygienist is also going to give local anesthetic. I actually went to school out East and in Ontario, when I went to school, we were not allowed to give freezing. So when I came back here, I actually had to take a separate course in Regina to be able to give local anesthetic. Dentists really like that. If they're double booked, they'll usually book a patient with you first for a cleaning. And if they have a filling, then they'll see the dentist after, because after the cleaning, you'll be freezing them up. Sterilization protocols, disinfecting protocols, those are actually different for each. The disinfecting protocols might be different for each um, office that you work at, but the sterilization protocols are usually always the same. Disinfecting is just wiping down your room. With a disinfectant and sterilization, you're going to scrub your instruments. You're going to put them in a little ultrasonic bath. So it's just this little box that sits on a counter with a solution in it and it vibrates back and forth and it gets rid of all the other junk and gunk that you didn't scrub off your instruments. And then once that's done in the um, ultrasonic for 10 minutes, you're going to dry them off and you're going to put them in a big chamber. And that's a big box that can fit a lot of cassettes and that uses heat and pressure to dis or to sterilize things. Uh, dental hygienists can also do fissure sealants. That is when usually they're done on kids. When their adult teeth are first coming in, all those deep grooves, we want to prevent cavities from getting into there. So usually we'll just book them back and we'll put little plastic coatings on their teeth and it doesn't take long. Sharpening your instruments, you'll have to come in early and sharpen your instruments or stay late. This is really important. If you don't have sharp instruments, you cannot remove the tartar properly. You're going to burnish a tartar, okay? So it's just going to, instead of removing it, you're just kind of going to make it look like it's a little hill on um, the tooth. So make sure you listen in school how to sharpen your instruments properly and um, order new instruments when you need them. Hygienists can also take impressions for night guards or sport guards. So what that means is you're going to mix up a material that's kind of like a peanut butter consistency. You're going to put it in a tray and then you're going to put it on the top of their mouth, the top teeth, and then the bottom teeth. And then you can pour them up for molds um, for the assistance to make the night guards or sport guards. Um, medical emergencies. My office is lucky enough that we actually are able to do CPR once a year. Um, it's only recommended once every three years for our license, but um, it's a good refresher once a year to know how to deal with a medical emergency. I haven't, knock on wood, really haven't had any medical emergencies, mostly diabetics. Um, if they haven't ate in the morning, they're kind of woozy. So I sit them up, I go grab them some orange juice. I had a pregnant mom in my chair she wanted to get up and go to her daughter that was getting a uh, checkup done and she got up too fast and she hit the wall and then, yeah, I had to sit her back down in the chair. So just kind of fainting in emergencies. Oral hygiene care aids available and continuing education courses. You need to know what all new products are um, coming into the dental field. If you walk down a store aisle. There are so many products, toothbrushes, toothpaste, um, different types of floss, whitening. Your patients, they're going to ask you what's best. And um, you need to know, especially now the new trends is this charcoal toothpaste or, and everybody wants whiter teeth. So it's always a good idea to just keep on top of that because things are changing. And sometimes research um, studies have been done and it's like, what once was the best option now is no longer the best option for gingivitis or whatever. Uh, continuing education courses, um, whoops, sorry. Um, you'll have to do those uh, once a year. Um, there's a conference that you can go to and you just learn up on new things that are happening, um, anything that you want to kind of um, relearn or go over again if you're unsure. And that also goes towards your license. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later, the continuing education courses. Implants, dentures, bridges, uh, you need to know how to clean those and work with those. Implants, you actually cannot scale with regular scalers. You have to have special scalers or you will scratch the implants and your dentist will not be very happy with you. I can promise you that. Um, smoking cessation. Um, if a patient comes in, you can and they're smoking, you can talk to about them about that. Um, if they're interested in quitting, you can send them to certain places or on the webs on online to see where they can get help or to see where they are with quitting.
All right. So what skills and personality traits are best suited for this career? People skills, that's probably one of the most important ones because you're dealing with people every day. You have to be happy and you have to make them feel comfortable, answer any questions. You have to be able to communicate with them. And not only just with your patient in the chair, it's a good idea to be able to communicate with your team that you're working on. If you have any problems working it out and you have to be a team player. Good time management skills. You do have to be organized and you have to keep your eye on the clock because you're usually given one hour to do all those things. And it can be a little bit stressful at times, but you do have to watch that. Working on a team and working independently, um, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You are on a team and you help each other out, but yet you are also just working with yourself with the patient. So that's pretty cool too. Detail oriented. You are working in a small area, um, the mouth obviously, and but when you put the explorer in, you're going in between the teeth and you just have to be really careful and meticulous. And sometimes it's really hard to detect that tartar, but you'll get the hang of it. And it's, it's nice. It's good. It's satisfying. Like working with your hands. Our job is all hands basically. And which can come in, um, you can get repetitive strain injuries with that, but I'm going to talk about that later, but it's all hands. So if you like doing things with your hands, this is a good job. Continuous learner. I've talked about that already. You need to be up to date with all the new um, items that come up. Uh, patience. You have to be patient with your patient. Um, some are not very cooperative. Um, they don't want to be there. And you just have to kind of go with the flow and get what you can get done and just walk them through it. Critical thinker, that comes back to um, what is best for the patient. Do they need to come back every three or four months, six months? Do they need a referral to a periodontist? You need to be able to think what is the best game plan for your patient. Repetitive work. Do you like doing the same thing every day? Hygiene is the same thing every day, but it does give you a bit of variety because the patients that you see are always different and no mouth is the same. You might have a really dirty mouth, one patient, and then a really clean mouth the next. And of course, you should probably be a flosser. If you don't floss, you really shouldn't be telling other people to floss. <laughs> so start flossing. Okay, samples of dental equipment. And I'll show you some pictures here in the next slides. Hand scalers. Cavitron, the pan machine. I haven't really talked about the x-ray sensor. That um, is what we take the pictures that they bite down onto. Those are the bite wings. And actually it's really cool. I've been doing this for 13 years or I guess 17 years in the dental field. And it's crazy how it has changed just in that amount of time. We used to have to take the pictures, go into a dark room or, or develop them in a dark box. And then we went to, um, plates that it didn't matter if light touched it, you still had to go process it into a computer. And now these x-ray sensors, you actually plug it in with the, it's got a cord, you plug it into the USB port, and then you take the picture and it shows up right on the screen. So you can tell right away if you need to take a new picture or not. So that's really cool. The x-ray head, that's where the x-ray comes out of, and that's what takes the pictures. The sterilization chamber, I talked about that. The tray table, you're gonna, that's where you're gonna set your instruments on. You have your air water and your profi head um, attached to it. You have your suction, your loops. Um, you'll see probably when you go for appointments, your hygienist or dentist is wearing goggles and they have little loops attached to it. And what happens is it magnifies the area um, so that you can have better ergonomics. So you're sitting up straight and uh, you can see a lot better, makes everything bigger and up close. This is going to make, if you practice with these, you are going to have probably a longer working life as a dental hygienist. When I went to school, they were not mandatory. It was optional. I didn't, I don't use them. I wish I did get into the habit of using them. One hygienist I went to school with, or I'm working with, when she went to school, they were mandatory. So she had to. I don't wear them because I wear, if I wear contacts, it makes my eyes itchy and you have to wear contacts with loops if you um, don't have a prescription in your loops, okay? 
If you don't want to wear contacts and you can put a prescription in your loops, but then you're going to have to change your loops every time your um, prescription changes. Also, I would highly recommend as a student buying these loops, getting used to them at school, but because you get a deal. So as a student, you're probably going to pay about $1,200 to $1,500 for them. If you wait till you are working, you're probably going to pay three to 5,000. And that's just for basic. Uh, that's probably without a light. Okay, the next one, sharpening stone and tester that comes with um, sharpening your instruments, uh, local anesthetic syringe and carpules, and then a chair that the, the patient sits in. Okay, here are these loops that I was talking about on the upper left. You can see they are a bit heavy in the front, so they do always have a um, cord in the back to make sure that they're on your head nice and sturdy. You can see here, these are these little magnifying areas. And usually there's a little light at, not usually, sometimes there is a light at the top if you like that. If you do have a light, you need a battery pack. So you need to put that in a pocket. Um, everybody that uses them say they love them and they would never go back. Um, so yeah, Tavitron, this is in the middle here. This instrument, that's the one that sprays water and it vibrates back and forth. Here is the power level knob down here, and then you can adjust the water flow at the end of the handle. Um, and then over here to the right is the tray. You have your instruments there, your mirror, your explorer, your shepherd's hook explorer, what the dentist is gonna use, your polishing paste, your gauze and floss, your air water syringe tip, and then your uh, profi head. X-ray unit equipment, the, to the left here, that's, we have that in between our rooms. We actually share one between two hygienists in our office. Um, when you pull out, you use this cone here and you just put it towards the cheek and then you go push a button. Uh, to the right, this is the pan machine. The patient stands there. You can kind of see they put their chin on this area here, bite down, and then this big thing goes all the way around um, the patient's head and does a 360. A hygienist operatory is right here. This is the one that I've been working out of. So you have the chair that the patient sits in. You can see that the tray, it can move. Um, so it's nice, it's not just in one spot. It helps you be able to move it when you move around the patient to work and see better. I have a water bottle hookup. You can see the suction. You can see the pedals on the floor here for the Profi head and the Cavitron. I have a little table that my Cavitron sits on back there. And then of course they have the operator's chair and then the computer. To the right, this is that chamber that I was talking about. This chamber, we can fit about eight cassettes in. Um, and so that's that big box. Below it actually is the statum. And so we just use that for little things like the air water syringe tip, the profi head and stuff like that, the smaller items. And that one's a lot faster than this one. The chamber actually takes a little over an hour to sterilize instruments. And the statum takes about uh, five to 10 minutes. Okay. So I do have a video for you. Um, I was not able to get a video of the Cavitron where the water sprays, but I did actually manage to get a video of me scaling my husband's teeth. And so I will just show it to you here. I will say partway, I guess it's a 12 second video. So halfway through, you can see me working on his front teeth, but you'll also see where it's like, I pull the instrument up and I kind of, it's, um, resistant and so I can feel tartar in there even with the instrument and so I'll scrape and scrape and then you'll find me here the tartar give. So let me just get this up here. So I'm just working on his front teeth. You can hear the scraping. And this tooth here is there. The tartar came off. Okay. And that's what's used. That's we're using what's called a sickle scaler. There, when you're using the hand instruments, there are certain scalers that go in the back teeth and scalers that go in the front teeth. So Rewards of being a dental hygienist. You have a flexible schedule. 
And basically, you probably can pick your own hours. You can work part-time if you need to. Usually dental offices ha hire part-time hygienists because um, usually hygienists only work that, whether it's they are want to be a mom at home, volunteer elsewhere, or they just don't need to work full-time. It's really good that way. You get to meet different people. You have a whole bunch of different people in your chair and you hear some really cool stories and places people have been. And it's really good. It's nice to get to know them and their families. Work as part of a team and work family. Um, the dental field is a small community and your dental office is even smaller. And when you get to work with them for such a long time, they actually become your family. And when you love going to work, it, it just doesn't feel like work. You have a lot of fun. Building rapport with your patients and building trust. I kind of talked about that. Um, it's really nice and rewarding when you have a patient that is really scared, but yet they trust you and they keep coming back to you and you're getting that um, good relationship with them and their oral health and with you. Working with patients who truly want to better their oral health. There are some patients that will come in just because they have to get their teeth cleaned. And then there are patients that come in and they get their teeth cleaned because they want to, because they want to learn how to floss better. They ask you questions and it's just refreshing when that happens. Uh, I like wearing scrubs. It's like wearing pajamas to work. They're comfortable. I don't have a wardrobe for date night, but that's okay. I usually just wear scrubs and I won't wear them on date night, so, so that's good. Uh, satisfying to remove tartar and see how the tissues have healed up when the patient returns. Um, I have a weird personality where I'm a picker. So if a patient or a person has like a sunburn, I like to peel off the skin or watch Dr. Pimple Popper. I know there's some people out there like that. It's not just me. Um, if you do like that stuff, this is a really good job too. You'll find that satisfying. And if you go to Google some of the videos online, you can uh, Google the Cavitron use for calculus removal, and it's pretty satisfying to watch some of the extreme cases out there. Uh, wage. We make a good wage as a dental hygienist, which allows us to work part-time if we need to, and so uh, I will talk about that in a little bit. Challenges of being a dental hygienist. Uh, the number one is definitely, it's a physically demanding job. You are sitting in the same position for a very long time. You're kind of bent over a little bit. Sometimes you turn your neck when you shouldn't. So it can lead to neck and back pain if you don't uh, take care of your body. Repetitive strain injuries, most common is carpal tunnel. So basically when you're scaling, your, your whole hand is just going like this for however long, two hours or two, two units, sorry, which is uh, 30 minutes. Um, wheelchair patients that can't be transferred. There are a lot of wheelchairs now that they actually tip back, which is really nice, but sometimes they don't. And so you, they're sitting up in their wheelchair. And I actually just had a patient like this the other day. It was just an old school wheelchair. And I basically had to stand on my head trying to clean teeth. And you know what? You just do the best you can time constraints. I get an hour for my patients uh, to do everything that I need. And sometimes it's, you're rushing. And then, so sometimes it's like, okay, well, what needs to be pushed off to the next appointment? Well, really none of it should be pushed off to the next appointment. Okay. So you should always be doing all the things, but unfortunately that's not always the case. I know there are some offices actually that give you 45 minutes for um, a patient and I think that's kind of pushing the limits. I would recommend um, doing the one hour appointment at the very least. I know another office actually gives an hour and 20 minutes for a patient. Um, you will find some unpleasant mouths out there and it happens more often than you think. There's gonna be blood. Even on minimal patients, there might be a little bit of blood. Pus, if there's an infection somewhere, stinky breath, cottage cheese-like plaque. And I mean like, can't see the teeth plaque impacted food, um, and some people might throw up as well. You need to learn to deal with that. Um, there are things you can do to help with, like with the stinky breath, we keep um, dry tea bags in the lab. And so we just excuse ourselves from the patient and we put a tea bag in our mask. And sometimes I've duck cotton rolls up my nose. You just can't forget that you've done that if you go to pull down your mask and talk to a patient. Um, I haven't done that yet. So uh, I have been thrown up on and you just take it like champ and just help them out. 
The next thing, um, it's psychologically demanding at times uh, with challenging patients. Kids, kids are not easy. You don't have a lot of time to do kids, usually half an hour to 45 minutes. And if they're not cooperative, that is a short time to get everything done. Sometimes they're screaming and sometimes it, the parent tries to come in and help. And sometimes you don't get anything done. They won't even open for you. Uh, special needs patients, if they are maybe having a bad day and aren't cooperative, it's hard to get what you need to get done. And it's kind of stressful because they are there that day. It's hard to bring them out. So you try to do everything that you need to get done. Um, patients that don't want to be there, if they are scared, they tend to be rude. And some patients, they just don't like the feeling or if they haven't been there in a while and it's hurting them and they don't want freezing to help, they're rude. It's hard, it's hard not to take that personally. Um, in, when I first started, I took it very personally, but now I, I know it's not me and it's them. If the patient is scared and they're rude, usually they're friendly on the way out. So just know that it's not you. And it happens to a lot of us. And not all patients are like that. It happens once in a while. Uh, working in an office that does not align with your values. You'll know right away if this is the right office for you, even within a couple of weeks. Um, my office is very family oriented, which is really important to me. If I have sick kids or we want to go on a holiday last minute, my office is usually really good at letting me take time off for that. Okay, salary and benefits. So again, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, it depends on your office. So usually a hygienist gets paid wage or commission. So with a wage this year, um, new grads made 50, 47 to $50 an hour. With a wage, you'll get stat pay, you'll get vacation pay. And if you have a no-show or a can short notice cancellation, or for whatever reason, the receptionist doesn't book you a patient, you will get paid for that. So you work seven to three, you'll get paid seven to three. Commission is the other one. Um, usually it's a certain percentage of what you would bill as a hygienist. So that in your chair, that would include scaling, polish, fluoride, desensitizing, and um, oral hygiene instruction if you choose to bill for that. The a hygienist that just graduated this year, she got 35% commission. Um, this seems great. And if you have a full day, you can make a lot of money. You can make between, I think it's 70 to $80 an hour but you don't get vacation pay, you don't get stat pay, and if a patient isn't in your chair, you don't get paid, which it doesn't matter if your day looks busy, it can fall apart, especially in flu season, the fall. I, there was just last week, because of all the sicknesses, I had two patients, but I was there for seven and a half hours, and I still got paid for the seven and a half hours, even though I only saw two patients, whereas if I was on commission, I would not have made very much money that day. So just take those things into uh, consideration, because if you're missing patients, you're on commission, well, then it kind of goes back to the whole $50 an hour. Uniform allowance. Um, usually offices pay for your scrubs. You go buy them, you hand in the receipts, and they'll reimburse you um, or a certain amount. License fee. Some offices pay for your license fee, and I'm going to talk about that and how much that's going to cost. Continuing education. Uh, some offices pay for that as well. If you go to the conferences, there is um, a cost. And so they'll cover that for you. Free dental work. Dental work is expensive. So usually you and your family will get free dental work, um, which is nice. We don't get a pension. And then, so right now for vacation, I currently get paid for three weeks vacation. And at 15 years, I will get four weeks. I do pay into long-term disability and... I find this a benefit. I, like I said, I work for a family oriented office and as for work hours, you have to, it's usually early mornings, evening, some evenings, some weekends. We are trying, it's for those patients you want to be early in the morning that don't want to miss work in the evenings. Those patients, again, they come after work and the weekends, some patients can only come on the weekends. So right now I actually work one evening a week. It's on Mondays and I work 10 to seven. And then my mornings are usually 7 a.m. I'm there by 6.30 to sharpen my instruments and to prep my room 
so that I don't feel rushed right at seven when the patient gets there. I don't get paid when I'm there from 6.30 to 7 though. So that's on my own time. Um, and then, yeah, I pick a weekend that I want to work throughout um, each month and yeah, it works really well. Okay, educational requirements. So to get in, you need a grade 12 diploma. You need a letter from your dentist stating that you have good oral health. And then where I went to school out in Ontario, I needed to do an aptitude test. There are diploma programs, degree programs, um, and then there are some private schools. SASC Polytech is an advanced diploma program and it's three years long. I think the first year is just arts and science type stuff and then you get into the dental. But I, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the private school that I went to. Um, I actually got into two different schools uh, out in Ontario. And the one school that I was going to go to, um, a hygienist told me about it and I um, was gonna to go to that one because that's where she went. But then I heard that they were being reviewed for accreditation. So I phoned them and they said that, nope, it's, it's all good. We're, we're gonna keep our accreditation, no problem. I actually ended up not going to that school. I went to a different one. And it's a good thing because when I was in my third semester at my school, current school, that school closed down. Uh, because it lost its accreditation. If that happens, you can't just pick up and go into a third semester at another private school. You have to start over and you have to go into the first semester at a different school. And that happened to a girl. I was in my third semester at my current school. Her school shut down and she was right back in the beginner class with the other other girls there, not kids. Um, so yeah, so make sure if you're going to a private school out east, make sure it is accredited and, and do your research on it. Ask when the last time they were accredited because they do have to be reviewed every few years for accreditation. Um, you will get a diploma with that. And I said there's three semesters. So you did six months, you got three weeks off, did another six months, three weeks off, six months, and then you graduate. Um, my first semester, you're going to take basic um, dental classes, you're not going to work on any patients. I don't know if you can see this, this little guy here, he's a little type, he's missing his teeth. So uh, he's a little type of on that's what you're going to practice on for the first semester, learn your instruments, learn how to take x rays, it's pretty basic. So then you're going to go into your second semester and this is where you're going to see start to see patients. In order to pass your second semester where I was, I needed to have three cases. So I needed a minimal case, um, a perio case, and a child case. And you have to start and finish them without any help, without any warnings or failing anything. Also in the second semester, you are going to be learning oral pathology, any medications that they're taking. You get to learn about the good, the fun things. The, then you takes you into your last semester. I needed six cases that time. So I needed um, three perio, two minimal, and one child case. And I will also say, it doesn't matter where you go. I believe you have to find your own patients. That can be very stressful, but don't worry. You're going to make it through. Um, make sure you go talk to the receptionist at the clinic. Ask if they've had anybody phone in to see if they want a cleaning done, a new patient. Ask any friends or family members, anybody, if they know anybody that needs their teeth cleaned. Um, it will, it will be, it will feel like, um, it, you can't do it, but I promise you, you will, you'll make it through. Um, it is harder. Dental hygiene program is a lot harder because there's a theory, uh, component to it as well as a practical. Um, yeah, I went out to Mississauga and I didn't know anybody and I had a lot of empty chairs and it was stressful, but you still get all the things that you need to get done. Okay. How do I get licensed? So you've passed your, your um, schooling. Now you are going to write the national board exam. If you went to a non-accredited school and, um, you'll write your national board exam, but then you also need to do a practical board exam. Um, I don't really know much about that because I didn't have to take that. If you're working, if you went to school in Canada um, and you wanna to go to the States, you actually have to write a national board exam, a state board exam, and then a regional municipal exam. Uh, Janice that I work with, she is from the States, so she was telling me a little bit about this. After you write your national board exam and you pass it, 
you are going to have to be licensed through Saskatchewan Dental Hygienist Association. And that's your regulatory body. And that costs us $600. And then you need a liability insurance through the Canadian Dental Hygienist Association. And that is $244. And that is every October, once a year, you have to pay $844. So it can be a little bit pricey. Um, the license, the $600, Saskatchewan actually is the most expensive one of the most expensive provinces to license a dental hygienist. Okay. So with, I guess, again, with the um, license renewal, it's kind of nice if your if you're, um, employers pay for that. So how do I stay licensed? You have to renew your license once a year. For a hygienist in Saskatchewan, it's the end of October every year. CPR, you need that once every three years. My office does it once a year, which again is really nice. You need 45 continuing education points for over three years, okay? Um, one point is equal to one hour and SDHA, they host two conferences a year. One is in Saskatoon and one is in Regina. You can also take a whole bunch of courses online if you want. There are free ones or ones that you can pay for. You also, every time you do that, you do have to fill out a personal learning tool for each presentation you go to, basically saying what you've learned and how you're going to implement it into your practice. And then if you um, get audited after three years, um, you actually have to hand that in. So don't forget to do that. You have to write a GEM exam, which is on the STHA website. It's the jurisprudence education model. And that's once every three years. It is considered part of your continuing education points. And it's basically to make sure that you're keeping up with the rules and regulations. Okay, what else can a dental hygienist do? Where can I go from here? Dental hygiene is not a job where you can climb up the ladder, but there are a lot of um, opportunities um, for a dental hygienist rather than just gen general practice. So for example, if you wanted to be on the SDHA council, you can do that, the president, vice president, all those um, positions. Dental hygiene program instructor, you can be in the classroom or in a clinic, a mobile hygiene clinic. There is a girl in Calgary that does that. You can actually open up a clinic in your house if you want. There are a whole bunch of different rules and regulations for that. It'd be expensive, but that would be kind of fun. Uh, volunteer and go to more remote places that don't have access to dental care. Uh, hygienist that I work with, she went up north and she said it was really rewarding. I know that there have been other hygienists that actually travel um, to other countries and do that as well. Now, orthodontics, this is not for Saskatchewan. Um, where I was in Ontario, they actually get to place brackets. So they put on the braces. Um, we don't do that here. The assistants do that here. But I just thought I'd throw that in because I do know in Ontario that hygienists are allowed to do that. Long-term care facilities. This is where we go into those long-term care homes and we clean the elderly's teeth that are not able to come to our clinic. Um, again, with the whole um, x-ray thing that have changed over the last 13 years, they just came out with an, an x-ray gun. So you put your arms into your stomach it's really heavy and then you can hold it and actually take pictures or x-rays of these patients in the long-term care facilities and then you bring the x-ray back and you um, put it through the computer and develop them in the clinic so that's pretty cool that that's um, available for them as well you can work in a periodontics office. So that's a specialty office. That's where um, if the patient's pockets are too deep and we don't have the proper instruments to get down into those pockets, that's where we need to use our critical thinking skills and be like, no, you need more help than what I can give you. So I'm going to refer. They have special instruments um, to help with that, to help get clean that tartar out a lot better than we can. Um, general practice, which is what I do. You see patients of all ages, of all abilities, understandings, and yeah. Okay, how did I get here? It was kind of a windy road, but I made it. I started off at the U of R for education. I don't know if I was homesick or if it, it just, it didn't feel right to me. So I didn't go back at Chris, after Christmas. So then actually the next fall, I got into the U of S and I took arts and science. I was taking prerequisites for a dental hygiene degree program to go to BC actually. Um, but then I got into dental assisting 
and they wouldn't let me defer it. So I thought, well, I'll go to assisting because that'll help me get my foot into the dental field door. And so I worked as a dental assistant for one year and then I applied to dental hygiene um, out east and then I got in. I didn't, I did apply to Regina, but I didn't get in. The average is pretty competitive. So if you are wanting to go to the Regina program, I would say definitely um, get your average up. It is supposed to be a really one of the top programs. So um, why dental hygiene? Dental hygienists are in need. There are many offices available even right now. A dentist is always looking for a hygienist. A lot of hygienists work part-time, which allows you to find a job a lot easier. Uh, flexible hours, like I said, you have a great work-life balance if you need. Um, I was able to stay at home with my kids as they were younger um, and kind of picked up hours here and there when my husband was home to watch them. So that was really nice. Or maybe if you're a CrossFitter and you want to compete and you need that extra time in the gym, but you're working part-time, that's a great option too. It's 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 really nice. Uh, you will become close with your coworkers and employers. Uh, like I said, they become a second family. It doesn't feel like you're going to work when you're having fun all the time. Uh, I work with a fantastic office and I will be there until I'm done. And you get to build relationships and trust with your uh, patients and their families. It's nice when they come back to see you. Um, I actually... When I first started, I saw a five-year-old girl. And then a few weeks ago, I just saw her again, like I've been seeing her and she's graduating now. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> Having troubles pushing the right buttons here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I panicked for a second. <laughs> she's gonna think we're not there. <clears throat> I, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I mean, you said that that day, you know, you about an hour per patient. So on a, on a full day, how many patients do you see then? I, so I work full time and I'm working seven and a half hour days. I see seven patients if I'm seeing adults. Um, if I'm seeing kids, I'll see more than that. Okay. Yeah. yeah just say, I wasn't sure. I mean, you, it's funny you say that like, as a patient, I go to the, the dental hygienist here in town. You kind of yeah. you just, you see that hour with them you don't know what the rest of their day looks like yeah yes uh, okay now you mentioned the instruments and you mentioned those loops and stuff like that and the cost yeah. of them so with with all of your instruments do you do you have to purchase all of those instruments like like i mean not the x-ray machine or anything like that yeah. but the like the portable instruments like the all that or is it is that the office purchase nope the office does that okay yeah. usually so there's a, there's someone that does the ordering in the office and if you ever need anything you go talk to them yeah. Some more of this or more of that. So yeah. the loops, the loops, so that's kind of a personal piece of equipment. So that would be. Yeah. Sorry. So it actually is specific to each person. They take measurements on you because it has to be how, like when you're sitting up nice and tall, I have a longer torso. So my, my um, measurements are going to be a bit longer than somebody that's shorter than me or with a smaller torso. So um, when you go to the conferences that are held in Saskatoon or, or Regina, there's always these kiosks um, set up in another room and they're always, there's a whole bunch of vendors and you can, usually there's always a loop um, table. And so you can go and talk to them and they can measure you there if, if you're interested. Um, and then, yeah, going as a student, I didn't buy my loops as a student. So I'm actually not sure how you would go about doing that as part of your supplies. Um, maybe what I would do is contact the school and see what they think, or maybe what they do is bring somebody in to get them fitted for loops during the program when it first starts. I, I can see what you mean though. Like when you say that you wish, you know, like if you recommend people to start with them or, you know, right mm -hmm. during the beginning, because it's probably something you get used to, right? You know, you've been doing yes. it while now out it. It would probably be, Probably a big, big adjustment. Yeah, there's something yeah. that's competitive all the time, and all of a sudden you've thrown this whole new piece of equipment in there, and you kind of go to make that adjustment on the fly. That'd be probably. Yeah, yeah. I um, I first I did order some, and then I am selling them because, like I said, I don't wear contacts very often. They just scratch my eyes. So, but I did try them, and I always, it was after years of working, I'd go to go in the mouth, and then it was just awkward. I, I couldn't, I just not what I was used to. So, but people that wear them swear by them and they say they will never go back. 
Yeah, so. yeah, I think it's just something to get used to right at the very yeah. start. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you mentioned the girls. <laughs> Are there any guys like just to oh. say like well but it, it, you know like and I think that's a stereotype sometimes <laughs> but dental like a dental assistant uh, again I've never seen a dental assistant guy I've never seen a dental hygienist guy. Yeah. Are there any guys in the field? Yes, yes, Where it are? is um, female dominant, but there are some males. I did have males in my class as well. Um, some of the males, when they, they're they going through school, it's great. And then I actually know a hygienist who is a male. His hands were too big oh. um, sometimes. And so he actually doesn't, he did it for a year maybe. And then he went on to something new, but you see dentists with big hands and male dentists and they're doing their work. So I think it's just what you get used to. Well, I was yeah. going to say that it's just like, uh, there's male, there's male dentists and yeah, and yeah I did just in the hygiene or, or assisting world. I haven't, I've never yeah. run across any. And, and I thinking back to various students that, that I had that went on to dental assisting or that I, there were no guys, I, you know, right. and, you don't think yes. about it. You yeah. mentioned that. You kind of go, hmm, yeah. I don't ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There could be some guys out there interested in that. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. There are guys in the field. Okay. That's good yeah. to know. Um, the training in Ontario, do you know if that, you mentioned it's in Mississauga. Was there a, do you, do you want to mention the school or? or, or? Um, yeah. So, it was the Canadian Academy of Dental Hygiene. Okay. I believe they have changed their name now. It's on the corner of the QEW and here, Ontario Street. Okay. Um, they are still accredited, and now I think they do a dental assisting as well. Yeah. So somebody looking into it could look in, look into that. Yeah. It's good to know. Yeah. I think Burnett had a question. Yeah, there's a question from a viewer. Um, what do you mean by prerequisites for the dental hygiene program? So when you go to a degree program, you actually need to take, I, I think it's a year, maybe two years of arts and science to get in. So um, just kind of like if you go into dental to be a dentist, you need certain like chemistry, physics, all of that. You need like biology, English. I don't even remember all the other programs um, or the classes that you needed to take. Um, you have to take those and you have to have a good average to get in. Yeah, I think for any, any of those programs for that uh, student to look into what's what's required. Yeah, ahead of time. Yeah, whether yeah. it's a degree program or a diploma program. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also have a question, um, actually just basically one question, Chantel, because you did a very thorough job with your, um, <clears throat> with your slides. Um, if you could, if we've got, we'll have students that will watch this presentation. What would you tell your younger self uh, getting into this program or the journey? You talked about a little bit of a journey that you went on, but if you could go back and tell yourself, your, your younger self, a couple of things, what should students know? How, how should they prepare for this? Do you mean right out of grade 12 or just as my, as a young dental hygienist? Well, I think coming out of grade 12, I think students okay. sometimes struggle with, you know, what to do, how to do it. You know, is this mm -hmm. the job? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's kind of a tough question, but I think sometimes yeah. students want to know that, you know, it's okay to try different things, mm -hmm. but if they, if they knew dental hygienist was one of their, that's what they wanted to do. What would you tell them? Yeah. Um, I, when I was in grade 12, um, it was between education and the dental field. And I, I didn't know which way I wanted to go. So I just picked one and I felt like maybe I had rushed into it. I felt bad that I went into the university. I went to university and then it's like, you know what, this isn't for me. And then I kind of felt like a failure after when I didn't go back. But, um, honestly, I'm glad I did it that way because I found out that it wasn't for me. I, I wouldn't, you know, if I hadn't got into education and didn't try it, then I wouldn't have ever known that that wasn't for me. So I would say like, don't rush. If you don't, if you aren't sure what you want to do, take some time to think about it. You're still really young. And if you want to try um, something, then go for it. You're still young. Education is never a waste. You're always going to learn something from, you're always going to take something away. And if it's right for you, great. If it's not, well then try something different. Um, but yeah, I do. I love hygiene and I wish that I went into it a lot sooner. Um, but yeah, does that kind of answer your question? Oh, yeah, you bet it does. I, like I said, I think you're just reaffirming to students that it's okay to try things. Yeah. Yeah. 
and like I said, I know there's always a cost when you're trying things. Yes. But how else yeah. do you know? Um, and that's why these spotlights and these, these um, you know, our YouTube channel is so awesome for students because they get yeah. to take a, look, a, a closer look at the things that, you know, people say about their jobs. So yeah. thank you so much. Yes. Uh, yeah, no problem. That student had another question just that popped up there too. Do you recommend dental assisting to try that first and, and go that route or not? Or do you know? Um, you definitely can do dental assisting. Um, it will allow you to um, get the knowledge that you need for the different procedures. When the dentist is talking about something to a patient and the um, patient is like, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds great. But then when you sit back down with the patient and they're asking more questions, then you kind of know what they're talking about and you can explain it a little bit better. I'm glad that I did dental assisting first. I actually really enjoy dental assisting. There's a lot of variety there and working with the dentists, they were fantastic. And yeah, I, I liked it. Um, so it's, it's a good bridge. To, to it is. It definitely right. is. Yeah. Just like some people I know, they went dental assisting, dental hygiene, and now they're doing dentistry. So it's just. A whole gamut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I don't have any more questions, Chantel. That was an excellent, uh, like such a, just a great description of, uh, of the job because I, uh, again, like so many jobs, you see it from your aspect as a patient or just that little, little tidbit of, time you you are working with someone in the in a field and mm -hmm. you've kind of shown us the whole the whole what it's all about right from yeah training right through to uh, how it works with your family life and everything like that so I think that's a that's a very thorough description so I'd like to thank you very much for this uh, it's been a great session so I think we will end it at that